Hi everyone, I'm Praveen, and I'm going to present our work on semi-oblivious traffic engineering for wide area networks. This is a joint work with collaborators at Cornell, CMU, Facebook, and USI Lugano. So to start with, in order to meet various competing objectives, operators of wide area networks use traffic engineering to steer traffic in desirable ways. A good traffic engineering system should be able to provide high performance in terms of throughput and link utilization. It should be robust to failures, and it should handle any such occurrences gracefully. Traffic in wide area networks have various latency requirements, such as low latency for customer traffic, but more relaxed requirements for bulk replication traffic. And the traffic engineering system should be able to guarantee these requirements. Finally, it should be operationally simple, so that it is easy to re root cause and analyze any issues that may come up in production. And traffic engineering systems must achieve these competing objectives while navigating various challenges. For example, wide area networks grow based on predicted growth in demands, which leads to unstructured topology, unlike data center topologies. This also means that capacities may be added to links in a non-uniform manner. Failures, such as, a, such as a misbehaving router, or links going down is common in such networks, and a traffic engineering system must be robust to such failures. It is often difficult to predict traffic patterns in advance, and a traffic engineering system should be able to, su should be able to handle such mispredictions of tra or traffic bursts in a graceful manner. Also, it must take into account various, uh, operation, uh, various limitations imposed by the underlying hardware, such as, for example, the number of rules, the flow rules that may be installed on the routers is bounded. And finally, frequently updating the routing, routing state in response to changes in network state or network topology may lead to significant overheads. So let's look at some approaches to traffic engineering. The traditional approach to traffic engineering relies on tuning link weights in distributed routing protocols such as OSPF and CSPF and ECMP and so on so that they compute a good set of forwarding paths. Now, for instance, by increasing the link weight of this particular link, a network operator can steer traffic through this uh, alternative path. Now, this approach is simple to implement in practice as it harnesses the capabilities of widely deployed conventional protocols. However, optimizing link weights to achieve good performance in such systems is, is difficult in practice. And it often performs poorly when failures occur or during periods of reconvergence when link weights have been updated. So around five years ago, enabled by SDN, we started to see centralized solutions to tra traffic engineering. SDN gives us global visibility of the network as well as direct control over the network elements. So in principle, we could, we could use these capabilities to deploy the optimal routing scheme at every moment in time. For experts, we would solve the multi-commodity flow problem or MCF problem which formulates the routing problem as an optimization problem, and say we can use a LP optimizer to find the optimum solution. However, it is not practical to achieve optimal performance even using this approach. To understand why, note that to, achieve, to actually achieve optimal performance, we would need to solve the MCF problem very frequently in response to changing demands, and update the routing scheme that is deployed almost instantaneously. Now, this is not practical because of various operational constraints, for instance, let's look at the time required to solve an MCF instance. This graph shows the time taken by Gurobi's optimized LP solver to solve an MCF instance. The time taken to solve is shown on the y-axis, and the x-axis shows different traffic matrices over a uh, course of multiple days. And this data is based on a real wide area network operated by Facebook. We find that it takes roughly 30 seconds to solve each instance, and this imposes a fundamental lower bound on how frequently can we, or at what rate can we react to changes in the network. In addition, there is no guarantee that the solution of an MCF instance will be similar to the solution that you got in the, when you solved the previous instance based on demands a few minutes or a few seconds back. So this means that we will need to update the routing scheme every time we solve an MCF instance. And again, for the same network, we performed an analysis of path churn caused due to these updates, and we found that we need to add or remove about 1,500 to 2,000 paths in each iteration. And now these updates also need to be performed in a consistent manner, that is, so that to avoid any forwarding loops, black holes, or any transient congestion. 
And that would again impose significant overheads on routers. So how did people actually build practical centralized D systems in the presence of such overheads? Well, let's take a step back and see what a traffic engineering system actually does. A traffic engineering system essentially has to perform two tasks. First, first is path selection, which is to decide which set of paths to use from a source to a destination. And the second is rate adaptation, which decides how should you split traffic from a source to a destination across the multiple paths available between the two nodes. And it turns out that path selection is a slow and expensive process because you may need to update many geo-distributed routers for a single path update. On the other hand, updating splitting ratios for a source and destination pair is much faster because you need to update only at the ingress, in just node. And as you saw with MCF, performing both of these simultaneously in a tight loop has a lot of overheads. Now, since we literally can't literally set up or tear down these global paths, the key insight here is to modify the set of forwarding paths very infrequently, but we may change the splitting ratios more frequently. Now, how should we select these paths? It turns out that the selecting a good set of forwarding paths is tricky because we are sort of committing to these paths once we have installed these paths. And, and once we have installed these paths, we want these paths to enable us to achieve various objectives in a dynamic setting. So these paths must provide us the ability to route traffic with competitive latency, the flexibility to react to changes in demands, robustness to misprediction in demands, resilience to failures in the network, and so on. And the main thesis of our work is that using a static set of cleverly constructed paths can provide us near optimal performance and extremely good robustness. Specifically, we highlight that the path selection algorithm should have the following properties. It should select paths with, with low stretch to minimize latency. The path should be diverse enough to reroute around failures. And the path should be selected in a capacity aware and globally optimized manner to provide good load balancing. So I'll explain what I mean by capacity awareness and globally optimized in the next couple of slides. So let's look at capacity awareness and why it is needed. So consider the example topology shown here where each link has 100 Gbps capacity except the link G2E, which is shown as uh, dotted lines here, which, is, which has 10 Gbps capacity. Now also assume that the link weights are proportional to their depicted lengths. And, and let's say we are using uh, some shortest path based schemes such as ECMP or K-shortest paths. And in this case, we will be using just a single path. Now since the path selection algorithms uh, are not capacity aware in this case, when A, B, and C want to send traffic to the node E in this case, all the paths, all the shortest paths will end up using the same link G, which has low capacity. And this can lead to high congestion in the network, and, and even though there is some spare capacity left in the network. Let's modify our previous algorithm to be capacity aware now. Something similar to CSPA for constraint shortest path first, which finds the shortest path with available capacity. Let's also make the link capacities from the previous example to be uniform, say 100 Gbps in this case and assume that the flows arrive in the following order and where each flow demand is equal to 100 Gbps as well. First, A wants to send some traffic to E, and in this case, it will take the shortest path through G because it has sufficient capacity. Next, when B wants to send some traffic to E, it cannot use the link through G, the link G because uh, that link is saturated now, so it will take a slightly longer path. And finally, when C wants to send traffic to E, it will have to take this even longer detour because the other shorter, shorter paths do not have sufficient capacity available. Now, this is clearly a suboptimal selection of paths. And this is because the paths were not selected in a globally optimized manner. However, instead, if we had computed paths by taking every source and destination pair into account, we could have computed a much better set of paths. And it turns out that uh, we find that most commonly used path algorithms, path selection algorithms, often do not meet all the criteria for good path selection. As an example, while shortest path based schemes such as ECMP, CSPF, K shortest paths can provide you low stretch or low latency, they are not optimized to give you uh, robustness, or they are, not uh, they are not optimized to give you good load balancing guarantees. Now, to get good load balancing, balancing you can switch to MCF. But oftentimes you'll see that uh, MCF produces a brittle set of paths and which, which, have low, which have high latency. 
So previously, people have tried to use uh, demand oblivious schemes, such as valiant load balancing or VLB, in order to achieve good performance. So let's look at VLB and oblivious routing in a bit more detail. VLB works by routing packets through random intermediate hops. The sender simply sends packets to other nodes at random, and these intermediate nodes in turn forward the packet to their destination. So VLB has been shown to work really well in mesh-like topologies while being robust to failures. It has also been applied in the context of wide area networks. Sorry. However, wide area networks do not have mesh-like topologies. So while VLB still provides good robustness, it often leads to very long paths, especially when the source and destination are close by. For example, imagine sending traffic from Seattle to San Francisco via New York. This also leads to high congestion because, uh, because the same traffic contributes to utilization on more links in this case. And hence, this leads to degraded performance. Oblivious routing, which was proposed by Reka in 2008, generalizes VLB to non-mesh topologies. It does so by providing a hierarchy of intermediate hops instead of a single intermediate hop. It iteratively computes a distribution over routing trees called a randomized routing tree. And each routing tree is computed using an approximation algorithm that guarantees that the path lengths in the tree are close to their shortest paths. So in the previous example where we wanted to route traffic from Seattle to San Francisco, we can imagine that this puts a constraint that traffic should not leave the western half of the US. Also, in each iteration of this path selection algorithm, the weight of each link is adjusted based on its cumulative usage in the past few routing trees. So this ensures that, not, uh, that no single link is overutilized, and this in turn results in a set of routing trees that provide you good load balancing, as well as, diverse, as, well as the paths are diverse enough to be robust to failures. And hence, we find that oblivious routing meets the criteria for good path selection algorithm. So the oblivious routing scheme thus generated has been shown to be log n competitive with MCF. This means that uh, no matter what demands arise in practice, the maximum congestion that you will see when using an oblivious routing scheme will be within a constant factor of what you would see when you're using the optimal MCF-based scheme. Now, while the log n competitive performance with respect to optimal MCF is an impressive theoretical result, it still, need, it still means that you need to over-provision your network by a uh, constant factor, which is, which is impractical in practice. So the question is, can we do better? And it turns out the answer is yes. And to see how, how we do this, let's go back to our traffic engineering model of static path selection and dynamic rate adaptation. Smore proposes using oblivious routing to select paths which are low stretch, robust to failures, and provide good load balancing properties. Smore combines them with dynamic rate adaptation, and it uses an LP to optimize the splitting ratios used to map traffic to paths in order to achieve better performance. Now, this approach of semi-oblivious routing has been studied previously, and, and it has been shown to be not significantly better than oblivious routing in the worst case. But these worst case scenarios, consisting of artificial traffic matrices and topologies, do not really uh, occur in practice. In fact, as topologies evolve in response to changing or predicted demands, there's often an implicit correlation between the, between the demand matrices that you see and the link, uh, link capacities. So we asked this question of how well does semi-oblivious routing perform in practice? So to analyze the performance and robustness of SMOR, we performed extensive evaluation using, Facebook's, using data from Facebook's wide area network. The network follows a common network designed for content provider, consisting of several large data centers and points of presence across the globe. Traffic on this network consists of both latency-sensitive traffic, such as customer traffic, as well as background or uh, elastic traffic. And we collected accurate snapshot of the network, consisting of topology and traffic matrices for over a month, and we performed high-fidelity simulations to perform performance and robustness characteristics. To compare with other traffic engineering systems, we implemented a wide range of systems ranging from traditional schemes to more recently proposed ones. We also implemented an optimal TE scheme based on MCF to serve as a benchmark, even though it is not practical to implement such a scheme in, in, in real world. This optimal scheme assumes that there are no operational constraints and it is allowed to use an infinite number of paths for routing. So let's look at performance of these systems on Facebook's wide area network. 
we'll look at metrics of throughput and maximum congestion in the network. Uh, the x-axis shows time for each uh, traffic engineering system for over half a week. And on the y-axis, we have normalized values for different metrics such as throughput and maximum congestion. So when, you, when using the optimal approach, we found that optimal MCF was able to route traffic without route 100% of the traffic, and the maximum con maximum link, link congestion varied between 40% to 65%, following a sort of diurnal pattern. Without going into too much details in each, for each of these traffic engineering systems, uh, I just want to highlight that while uh, with the exception of CSPF, Oblivious, and S'more, almost every other traffic engineering system uh, saturated at least one of the links, which led to loss due to congestion. And in fact, S'more remains closest to optimal with a maximum congestion within 16% of optimal on average. Next, we also performed an experiment to analyze the robustness. This experiment is similar to the previous case, but for each traffic matrix, we fail one random link in, in the topology. After failing this link, we allowed the traffic engineering system to react to such failures and change the routing scheme if it wanted to. So as expected, Optimal T is again able to, re uh, to reroute around most failures, and it gives you low congestion. However, the congestion increased compared to previous case because you had to reroute this traffic along, along an alternate path. Similarly, we found, that the, we found that the maximum congestion for other traffic engineering schemes also increased. And S'more remained competitive with Optimal in terms of maximum congestion, and was again able to deliver around 100, uh, approximately 100% of the throughput. So these experiments were done on, under a path budget of four, except for Optimal. And this path budget of four means that we constrained these traffic engineering systems to use only up to four paths from a source to a destination. Now it turns out that on increasing these, uh, this path budget of four, we find that these other traffic engineering systems, such as those based on case shortest paths and combined with dynamic rate adaptation, also achieve near optimal performance when the, when the set of paths become diverse enough. And for this to happen, the, num the path budget we had to set was close to 32, which is almost eight times what you need to have with S'more. So the, the paper discusses other operation cons uh, constraints in more detail. However, now, a natural question to ask is whether these results are specific to Facebook's wide area network, or do the results generalize over a larger set of topologies and operational conditions? So to answer this question, we performed, a, we performed large scale simulations using topologies from Internet, topo Internet Topology Zoo and other ISPs, as well as we used traffic matrices from other ISPs, and we generated more traffic matrices using the gravity model. And we modeled a few other uh, operational conditions using the simulator. And we, find that we found that while, while we did see some variation in performance across these different topologies and operational conditions, we found that S'more has better performance and robustness guarantees overall. For instance, the plot on the left shows normalized capacity on, on the x-axis for different traffic engineering systems, where capacity is defined as by what factor did we have to scale the traffic matrix before we, we saturated at least one link. And the values here are normalized with respect to optimal traffic engineering, and we see that small performs quite close to optimal. The graph on the right side shows, uh, shows the probability of achieving different level of availability SLAs, and we again find that small is quite robust to failures in network. So to summarize, we found that path selection is critical to the performance and reliability of traffic engineering systems. Semi-oblivious traffic engineering, which combines oblivious routing for path selection with dynamic rate adaptation, meets the competing objectives of of traffic engineering by providing near optimal performance and high level of reliability. And finally, we have made our implementation open source on GitHub, so feel free to check it out. Thank you. Hey, uh, Sanjay from Purdue. A couple of questions. So do you... Um, change your paths when there are failures, or are your paths fixed whether there are failures or not? So the paths are fixed whether there are failures or not. We do not change the paths once we have committed to a set of paths. Uh, but isn't it reasonable to add more paths on failures, or is your, do your discussions? Sure. So we implemented two kinds of uh, reactions to failures. One was called one we call local rerouting, in which we do not set, change the set of paths because it takes slightly longer. 
So as soon as we detect a failure, we just try to rebalance traffic across existing paths which have not been affected. And on a longer time scale, once we can recompute the optimal set of paths again, and we can install those paths. Okay. And the other thing, I might have missed it. Uh, how many, uh, so you said the semi-oblivious works close to optimal. Yes. How many paths are you talking about? Did, did you say four to eight or? So as, obviously as you increase the number of paths, the performance would improve. Right. So, uh, so this graph, sorry. This graph shows the performance of uh, different traffic engineering systems versus the path budget. And the black dotted lines is the optimal scheme in which there is no limit on the number of paths. So we found that around four to, with four to six paths, SMORE performs quite close to optimal. Okay, thank you. All right, well, let's thank our speaker again.